types of reactions. Specifically types of reactions, we're going to go through the ones in the summer assignment packet. <laughs> but what we're looking at right now is specifically for chapter four, and this unit is the solution types of reactions. There are three possible ones that involve solutions. One of them being precipitation reactions, which is the main one we're going to be looking at today in the notes. Acid-base reactions and redox ones, oxidation reduction ones, those ones we're going to be taking a look at in the notes three, okay? So, let's go ahead and talk about chemical reactions. We need to, of course, chemical reaction in general is going to uh, show you that bonds are breaking, bonds are forming, you're getting new substances, and why do we need to balance our chemical equations? What's the reason why we balance our chemical equations? So yeah, so the law of conservation of matter mass Sometimes it's phrases matter, sometimes it's phrases mass. Law of conservation of matter mass is showing that matter is not created nor destroyed. It just gets altered. That's what I was talking about in chemical reaction. You have bonds breaking, bonds forming, you get new substances. Double replacement in which a solid forms. Now that we're talking about in solution chemistry, we have two solutions. You put them together and now you get a new solid forming. These are called precipitation reactions. And that solid that forms and the crystals that fall to the bottom are called precipitates. And this should be familiar from last year. We did some precipitation chemistry last year. We still have, you're taking two things that are uh, soluble, that are dissolved in solution. So you have the water molecules surrounding them. But in this process, then uh, an ionic bond will form between the two ions that form the precipitate so that it crystallizes and falls to the bottom. Double displacement, double replacement, same idea here um, in terms of precipitation reactions. Now here in this graphic showing you before the bond forms, in this case if you're looking at the key, uh, here's the potassium, here's the barium, here's the nitrate, here's the uh, chromate. So as you see them individually floating around in the water before, then afterwards the barium, aqueous barium and the aqueous chromate, because this one happens to be insoluble, and it's going to form a bond, an attractive force, an ionic bond, the lombic attraction, and sink to the bottom and now form crystals. And that's what's signified here on this part of the picture. And in real lab, it looks like yellow uh, solid at the bottom, okay? So once again, you see how frequently we're showing you these circle diagrams, these pictorial representations at the molecular atomic level, important for the AP exam. Silver ions react with chloride ions to form the precipitate silver chloride. In this animation of a precipitation reaction, the silver ions, shown in gray, and the chloride ions, shown in green, are active participants in the reaction and combine to form the insoluble silver chloride crystal. Other ions, called spectator ions, shown here in blue and purple, are not participants in the reaction and remain unchanged in the solution. There's a blue one right there. Just left the screen. So that newly established crystal here in the center, these are all ionic coulombic attractions occurring, forming to make that. And that ionic coulombic attraction is stronger than the ion dipole force of the water. So it kind of it, it beats out that force, so it forms a solid and drops to the bottom. So going back, reviewing some more terms here, solubles. Solid dissolves in solution. AQ is how we write it with aqueous next to it. Aqueous. 
soluble. The solid does not dissolve in solution. Okay, the S is used in the reaction next to it. And you realize that sometimes the words insoluble and slightly soluble are interchangeable. Now, the formation of the precipitate in the reaction, a lot of times um, after you've done, you've taken your two solutions, you put them together, they go in a beaker, the solid falls to the bottom. What you do is you filter out the solid, okay? You can filter out the solid and you can let it dry out. You can put it in the oven to dry out. And you can find the mass of the solid that was formed, and then you can do a bunch of stoichiometry conversions and figure out a lot of information about the reaction. The limiting reactant, excess reactant, the percent yield, all that good stuff. And you get that gravimetric analysis because the precipitate falls to the bottom. So then um, you're able to separate it from the solution. And we usually use filtration to do that. Simple rules for solubility. I am not sure if this is the exact same one that's in your packet. Hopefully it is. You don't have to memorize every single rule. But the ones that you should know are in bold at the top, definitely. These ones are very important. Okay. Alkali metal salts and ammonium salts are always soluble. Doesn't matter if they're with carbonate or phosphate or hydroxide down here. Any anytime you have group one or ammonium, it's always soluble. So if you can remember alkali metals and ammonium are always soluble, you can easily predict. And then the other one is the nitrates. Um, the nitrates and nitrites. I mean, nitrate is always soluble. Nitrite is also always soluble. So you can stick that in that category. As you see, the chlorate, perchlorate, and acetate. Remember, this is the um, organic way of writing acetate. Because, you know, we wrote acetate last year like this. But you'll see it written in that organic form, showing the structure, how it links together. The organic way represents the Spoonistot structure mainly. But because you see here, this is the CH3 part. That's the first part over here, CH3. And then the COO, that makes the rest of it. But you're drawing a list dot structure, that's what you see there. So we write it, in, and you'll see it more often in the organic way it's written. Now some of these other ones, like silver chloride is one they like to use, or the leads. Silver and lead, mercury they don't usually throw in there, but the silver lead ones precipitate out with the halides, like your chloride, bromide, and iodide. Those ones are kind of important, I mean, just to be able to recognize eventually. At this point, you know, it'd be great if you could have them all memorized, but I understand that it might take some time and some practice, and hopefully with the problem sets you'll get used to recognizing with the repetition. Fluorides are soluble except for with group 2. Sulfates are soluble except for many exceptions here. Calcium, strontium, barium group, that is the heavy group 2 metals. And then you have the silver, lead. Once again, that kind of groups in with the halides. And then the mercury, but like I said, we don't really see mercury a lot. Everything else is insoluble. Carbonates, phosphates, oxalates, chromates, sulfides, hydroxides, and oxides always insoluble unless they're with group one which would be alkali metals and ammonium if they're with group one they're soluble but if they're with something else they're going to be insoluble also on the hydroxides remember the hydroxides are part of the strong base category that's going to be group one so lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, all those. Those are always soluble. And then your other three, calcium, strontium, barium, they're strong bases. So they dissociate. They would also be considered in the soluble category because they're strong bases. 
remember strong bases and strong acids completely dissociate, break apart. So that would make them soluble. So don't forget that about the hydroxide. So a lot of information, like I said, as you're working through this problem set, you'll be doing lots of reactions. So do make sure that you have this out in front of you. You have the chart out in front of you as you're doing it. Make things so much easier. Okay? All right, which of the following ions form compounds with lead that are generally soluble in water? So if you go back to that rule list, Looking up here, there's only one thing I, that sticks out at me is automatically going to be soluble here. And it's going to be which one? Well, I mean, yes, it would be soluble, but it's not going to form a compound with NA because they're both positively charged. So we're looking for something that's going to form a compound and remain soluble. What's the only one on here that follows that solubility category? We're looking at the first two rules. C, nitrate. Nitrate. Anytime you see a nitrate, automatically know it's soluble. And they're going to be pretty obvious with you. They're going to give you a compound with an alkali metal or ammonium. They're going to give you like a nitrate. And then you can pretty much decide and figure out that the other two are going to be the precipitate. Okay? So let's take a look. Yeah, so the nitrates. Sulfides are insoluble, especially with lead. Chloride, we already know that was an exception to the rule for that one. And sulfate is also an exception for lead. And once again, sodium is not going to form a compound with lead because they're both cations. So they can't form compounds together. Now, using your solubility rules, predict what will happen when the following pairs of solutions are mixed. So go ahead and take a moment, check out your solubility rules. Okay, anybody have an idea for A? No precipitate, or we can also call it no reaction. If you look up here, we have K, which is the <laughs> alkali metal, nitrate, definitely soluble, soluble here. Both of them kind of designate soluble. Barium, although a heavy alkaline earth metal, is with the chloride. That's also soluble because only really lead and silver are the ones we focus on, lead, silver, mercury for the chlorides. But if you're doing a double replacement, that means the K is going to go with the Cl. The Ba is going to go with the NO3. Is anything going to actually form an ionic bond? No. So we would call this no precipitate. I also like to just put it as no reaction. You can write reaction like that. Rxn for abbreviation. So in this case, they're all just going to float in between the water molecules and not actually form a new bond. How about B? If we're following our double replacement, sodium would combine with the nitrate, and the lead is going to combine with the sulfate. So, yes? There will be a precipitate. There will be a precipitate, and our precipitate is going to be lead to sulfate. So yes, we're going to use the charge off of this compound, meaning the lead's going to be a plus two. The two nitrates at minus one mean the lead's plus two. We're going to follow that charge. Sulfate's always a negative two. Crisscross. So we are going to get a solid lead to sulfate precipitate. The other things are going to stay in solution. The sodium and the nitrate. They're not going to form precipitate. How about the last one down here? K with the nitrate, no. Fe with the OH. That's not one of our strong bases. That's not an alkali metal or the calcium strontium barium. So the lead, I'm sorry, the iron, still thinking lead for the previous problem. The iron is going to be a plus three charge. And we know hydroxide's minus one. So when we crisscross, we end up getting what? iron 3 hydroxide and that's going to be the precipitate that forms. So we get lead 2 sulfate forming, iron 3 hydroxide forming, and no reaction. Now for the formula or molecular equation, this gives the overall reaction, but not necessarily the actual forms of the reactants of products and solutions. 
And here they're generally shown as compounds. Okay, so they're not split up into their ions. This is what we would call like the basic balanced reaction from last year. That all of your reactants together, all of your products together, you didn't break them apart, you didn't do anything with them, but you balanced them. So this is like the molecular or complete equation. I'm sorry, not complete equation, complete balanced equation. So for instance, down here you see silver nitrate, you see sodium chloride. We're going to make uh, silver chloride solid precipitate, and then the sodium uh, nitrate will be spectate. But this is what the overall balanced molecular equation would look like. Now, in real essence, we don't write all of that anymore in AP. We're going past that stage of just writing out the regular balanced reaction. Because in AP, we concentrate pretty much primarily on the only things that are reacting. We don't care about the ones that aren't reacting. Now, does everybody remember the complete ionic equation from last year? Probably did this briefly in honors, if you were in the honors class, where you have to do what? Especially with the aqueous ones. Separate them into their ions. Okay, so you're putting everything that is aqueous into their ion form. The only thing that doesn't go into ion form is if it's a solid. So the silver chloride here, since it's a solid precipitate, it does not break apart because it has formed a bond and it is now a solid. So let's take and visit our complete ionic equations. So basically all substances that are strong electrolytes or soluble are going to break apart into their ions and you have to break them apart. So here, the silver and the nitrate are both soluble. They break apart into their ions. The sodium and the chloride are both soluble, so they break apart into their ions. That's before you put the two, like you're taking the two flasks of the solution, this is, you know, before you dump them together. When we put them together in a new beaker or a flask, that's the arrow. Now we have the reaction occurring. So over here on this side, after the reaction, the, sodium, the silver chloride has fallen to the bottom. So we keep that together as a solid, doesn't break apart. But the other two that did not react at all are going to stay separated. Because they're still you know, surrounded by the waters, floating around in that solution. The sodium would be surrounded by the oxygen side of the water, the nitrates would be surrounded by the hydrogen sides of the water, but they're still in solution just floating around. We call them spectators. Okay, so they're part of the crowd watching the show. Whereas the silver and the chloride are actually part of the action. They're the ones forming the bond the new ionic bond that's stronger than the water interaction, so it's going to fall to the bottom. So the silver chloride's playing the game. The sodium nitrate is up in the stands just watching the show. That's why I would call them spectators. Okay, so this one is really long and I hate writing it. So hopefully you'll get good quickly of being able to cross out those spectators so you can concentrate only on the ones that are reacting. And the only ones here reacting are the silver and the chloride. Okay? The faster you get at writing net ionic, the better you're going to be. And it may take a, a few, few times where you have to write out the complete ionics first before you cross them out. Okay? So the net ionic equation only shows the components of the elements or the ions that are actually reacting. So here, see how much shorter the uh, net ionic is? Much shorter. You're just showing silver and chloride are reacting, making silver chloride. The Na and NO3, these guys are what we know as spectators. They don't participate in the reaction. They float in between the waters still. And when working a problem like this, what do I need to have out in front of me? 
I need to have those solubility rules out so I can figure out who's going to precipitate. So we have a reaction between cobalt two chloride, sodium hydroxide. So I need to start there. What do I need to write out first? The two formulas of these reactants. So cobalt two chloride means CO with a two plus. Cl with a minus one, we crisscross, we get CO, Cl2. So that is my first one. Okay, and we're assuming they are aqueous. They're in solution. Solubility rules telling us this is how it's going. Sodium hydroxide. What is the formula for sodium hydroxide? NaOH, remember, Na is group 1, hydroxide is minus 1, so NaOH, also a Q. Okay? Now, figuring out who's going to combine with who. Sodium would go with the chloride, so we're going to get what? Na. CL. Now, is that going to be aqueous or is that going to be a solid? Aqueous. Aqueous. Good. Because that, according to our solubility rule, sodium chloride is aqueous. Now, the other two, we've got the cobalt two combining with the hydroxide. So that one, we're going to follow that this cobalt two still stuck with the plus two charge here. In double replacement reactions with precipitates, remember the charges do not change. You don't have a redox going on. So we're going to get COOH with A2, and then I need my solid out there, right? Because it's forming a precipitate. It's a hydroxide that's not group 1 or calcium, strontium, or barium. Now what do I need to do before I move on? Um, balance the equation, so I need to put a 2 here, and I need to put a 2 there. Am I balanced? Simplistic enough? All right, now for the fun time. This is the long one, the complete ionic. So, does the, the cobalt 2 chloride break apart? AQ, it's going to break apart. Now, notice that there's a 2 here. So every time this breaks apart, how many chlorides are we going to get? So you need a 2 out front of that. Because every time this breaks apart, we're going to get 2 chlorides out of it. Okay, that's the one reactant. Look at the other reactant. It's AQ. Now, according to our balanced equation, how many sodiums do we need? How many hydroxides? We're going to need two, so we're going to break it apart, but we're going to keep it balanced. Sorry, my eight are getting kind of small, but I'm going to run out of space then. Now for the NaCl. I'm going to do what with that? Break it up two, and it has the two out front, so I'm going to keep that balanced thing in there. And two chlorides. And then last but not least, we have our cobalt two hydroxide that's still the solid and it stays together. So that would be our complete ionic equation. Now, I think the easiest thing to do to figure out the net ionic is to cross out your spectators. Okay? So, or circle your spectators, you could do. So sodium is the same as the sodium on this side, so that's a spectator. The chloride, and the chloride is a spectator. So what else, what do I just only need to write for my net ionic, who's actually reacting? Cobalt and hydroxide. So this would be the CO2 plus, AQ plus the two hydroxides, AQ, and that's going to give us our solid. 
and that's your net ionic. So the net ionic is always the easiest because it's shorter. And this is really what we need to focus on in AP because you really got to get quickly down here to that. You'll practice a lot before you get to that point where you're real good at crossing things out and getting to that net ionic. But that's the goal to be focusing on. Just focusing on how to get to that net ionic the fastest that you can. So now I would like you to try exercise 9. A and B. Okay, up here you see this answer. All right, moving on. The aqueous potassium chloride added to the aqueous silver nitrate to form silver chloride precipitate plus aqueous <laughs> potassium nitrate. Well, that's nice. They even told you the precipitate for you, so you didn't have to figure it out. And they gave you the AQ for the potassium nitrate. So hopefully you got it right. I tried to color code it for you to make it easier to read. So as you see, in the balanced molecular reaction up here, there's no ions. The complete ionic, you break apart everything that's AQ for this one. And the net ionic is the only thing doing the actual chemical bond, or the ionic coulombic attraction bond forming between the silver chloride here. Okay, so hopefully we have time to look at the next one. Aqueous potassium hydroxide is mixed with aqueous iron 3 nitrate to form a precipitate of iron 3 hydroxide and aqueous potassium nitrate. So we got to this one, yes, no. Uh, some people did. But in, um, to proceed with time, I'm going to go ahead and show you the answer. You're always welcome to go back to the video, watch the video, write this down, or grab your friend's notes to jot these down. Okay, Same idea here. I think the only major difference is this one you had to deal with balancing the equation. Because everything was at one to one, right? Everything was not one to one here. You had the threes. All right, so then you had to balance them in the um, complete ionic. And then lastly here, make sure that your OHs were balanced when you were creating the iron 3 hydroxide. So that's the only thing. When you break apart the ions, if the crystal breaks apart and makes, you know, since the iron uh, 3 nitrate, every time that broke apart, you're going to get three nitrates out of it. You need to make sure you balance it with the three in front of the nitrate. And then same thing with the hydroxide. You're going to need three hydroxides from the balanced KOH over here. Three, three uh, potassium ions, three hydroxide ions. So that was what would be important there. Yes? Uh, usually what you'll see, I mean, I don't think it would, if, if you wrote it the other way around, I don't think that they would take off a point for that. But what you'll see in all of the textbooks and in Mastering Chem, the cations always written first, the anions always written second. Back that I don't think a scorer on the AP exam, if you put three hydroxide AQ first, I don't think they would take off of that. Okay? Because yeah, you think here, if you're crossing off, these guys are out of order. Yeah, the anions first, the cations second. Just as long as you have the, the two things that are reacting, making the final product, the new precipitate, I think you should be fine. And I certainly would not take off for that on the test. Okay? So that's a good question. All right, so now we're going to get into some solution stoic. I think it's lots of fun here. I know. Yay, right? Okay, solution stoic. Identify the species present in the combined solution and determine what reaction occurs. Write out that balanced net ionic equation for the reaction. Calculate the moles. Determine which reactant is limiting. Calculate the moles of products. And convert to grams or other units as required. That's one set of steps that you can follow. I like to sometimes um, convert everything to grams. You can do that too. You can still figure out the limiting that way and the theoretical yield that way. But this is already in your notes here written down for you. 
So let's take a look here at our first part. 10 milliliters of a 0.30 M sodium phosphate solution reacts with 20 milliliters of a 0.2 M lead 2 nitrate solution. Assume no volume change. Remember, they're assuming they're additive. So the first thing we need to figure out is what precipitate will form. We need to see here, okay, we have lead to nitrate, sodium phosphate. So it might be a good thing to go ahead and write out that balanced equation. I'm just going to write down here because I can't reach all the way up there. Uh, so we have Na3PO4 okay, plus our PBNO3 with the two. Okay, for following our solubility rules, we know that a sodium will combine with the nitrate, NaNO3, and are we following the double replacement reaction? We know the lead will combine with the phosphate. Since it's a plus two at this point right here, it's going to be Pb3PO4, the two outside. Now, deciding using your solubility rules, are either one of those products a precipitate? The lead to phosphate. This one's going to actually be the solid. We know this one's going to stay AQ. These ones are already AQ because they told us they were, because they were in solution. Okay. But before we can really continue on with any stoic, what do we need to do to this equation? needs to be balanced. Well, like I said, due to time, I'm just going to balance it real quick. This one it takes probably a little bit more time, but I'll just do it real quick. This one, you need a six here. There you go. So we know the precipitate. We figured that part out. what mass a precipitate will form. So we need to do two separate tracks here. Do a limiting reactant problem to figure out this amount, this theoretical yield. So I basically need to take both reactants and work it to the product. Okay, so my first reactant here, you can use your molarity equation to find the moles before you begin. You're welcome to do that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to set up the problem as a conversion factor. Molarity is a conversion factor. I'm going to start off with the volume of my sodium phosphate. What do I need to do to that before I can use it? Change to liters, one, two, three. I've got liters, so I'm sorry, it's 0 0.010 liters of sodium phosphate. Okay. And I know I have 0 0.30 molar solution. So 0 0.30 molar, one mole, I mean, it's 0 0.30 moles over one liter of my sodium phosphate. So I, I take this part out by sticking it right here. Does everybody see that? Now I can go directly into stoic. Because I can now do moles of my Na3PO4. It's supposed to be a 3. It didn't really come out to be a 3, did it? Na3PO4. And I can go to directly to moles of what? 
bold of PEB 3 EO 4 2 right? Because I'm working it to the lead 2 phosphate. So if I look at my balance equation, what's the coefficient there? It's a 1. How about for this guy? 2. Now, what did it want? It wanted the mass, right? So I'm going to keep going and work it to the mass, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, one mole of my PB3 of 4, 2 is going to be how many grams? It would take take a while on the to, to add it all up, but it's a big number. Because lead is very heavy. It's like 200 something, right? There's three of them. So it's a pretty heavy compound. Okay. And now we can see how the labels will cancel. Liters is liters. Moles with moles. The other moles of the lead to uh, phosphate will cancel with the moles of the lead to phosphate. What do we end up with? Our grams of our lead to phosphate. Okay. We calculate this. What do we end up with? Okay, so 1.22. Let's look at our sig fig. This one has three. This one has two. So we should just round it to two. So 1.20 or 1.2 grams EB3 CO4 two. Okay. So that's only the first part. These are fun, aren't they? I know they're long. All right. That was to figure out the, what the first reactant would produce. Now I need to do what the second reactant is going to produce. And which one ever comes out smaller is going to be my the limiting reactant and also the theoretical yield of the mass produced. Okay? So let's go ahead and set that one up. 0 0.0200. I guess there's this picture right there. Liters. This is of our PB and O3. One liter is how many moles of this? 0 0.20 moles PB and O3. Right? Now we can go directly from diagonal down our moles PB. And at three, two, and go to our moles of our P three PO four. So now we're using the start stoic component. This is still a one because the balance equation is a one, but this guy is a what? Three, so three goes there. Then we continue on. The track is still the same at the end, right? Because we're changing it to grams, so that doesn't change. That's nice. You don't have to recalculate that. One mole EB3 or 2 equals 854 grams EB3 or 2. So, this one is what? 1.08, so we round that to 1.1 grams. Which one comes out less? 1.1 less, this is your theoretical yield, mass produced. And we also identified our, this guy's the limiting reactant. So therefore, this one is the S reactant. Now, the concentrate of nit nitrate ions left in solution after the reaction is complete. This part's easy compared to the last part is finding the phosphates left in solution. So I'm going to try to get through the nitrate ions today, and then we'll do the, start with the phosphate ions next time. So you see our answers there. All right, what's the concentration of nitrate ions left in solution after the reaction is complete? This is kind of like what we did before. 
The nitrate ions, do any of them precipitate out? No, none of them precipitate out. So, all we really need to do is find the what? The what of the nitrate? Yeah, what's concentration again? Which is also moles over liters. So I need to know the what about the nitrate? Moles. And then I need to know the, the new volumes. Remember, we're taking two, putting it together, right? Two separate volumes, putting it together. All right, so where are moles of our nitrate? Remember, the nitrate was part of the PV. No, three, two. None of them precipitate out, so I can just use those values. Still using my conversion factor. PV NO3 2 equals 1 liter. This is just kind of like the problem we did the previous day. Now in one mole of PV NO3 2, how many moles of nitrate do we have coming out every time that breaks apart? Try to break the part, we're going to get two nitrates. Okay. And what's our new volume? If we put 10 and 20 together. So our new volume is going to be 30 milliliters. I could divide at the very end by the 30 milliliters or go ahead and change it to liters here. Right? Okay. So whatever I calculate this value to be, I could just immediately go ahead and divide it by the 30, which is that new volume. Don't forget to do the new volume, not the original volume, the new volume. Because we want it after the reaction has taken place. And remember to round at the very end. So 0.02 times 0.2 times 2 gives us. Point zero zero three zeros or point zero zero eight so moles, whatever. Divided by our point oh three and our concentration is point two six six six, but we're gonna change that to point two seven M of nitrate. When we have to do the phosphate, though, we have to figure out how much of the phosphate actually drops to the bottom and how much is still floating around in the water. So there's a little bit extra to that one. We'll catch that next time.